So people should be coming in the room. Morning, we're just gonna wait a minute or two. So please bear with us. Welcome to our webinar of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub. Bear with us as we let others in the room. Okay, thank you for your patience, everybody. Forgive my redundancy. We're just gonna wait a minute or two for people, more people to enter the room. Okay, I hope wherever you are, you've been having a good day. So I'm going to start now as other people join us. So good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. I am Susan Aronson. I direct the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at GW, and I am co-PI of the NIST NSF, Trustworthy AI Institute. And today I'm very pleased to welcome you, our participants, and your questions, and our speaker, Dr. Bao Bao Zhang. Dr. Zhang is a professor at Syracuse University. She is among the America's leading experts on AI governance. But what makes her special, I think, is that she really understands the role of the public in this discussion. And how difficult it is to really understand what the public thinks about AI and how it should be governed. So I'm gonna, we're gonna start, I wanna thank our co-organizers and funders, um, and you saw them on the registration form. And so if you don't mind, Bao Bao, sharing your slides, we'll get started. She will speak for 20 minutes. And then we open it up to your questions. So if you don't mind putting your questions in the Q&A, um, we will answer them during the next hour. Ready? Yep. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone in the audience for coming to uh, this webinar today, I'm going to present for about 20 minutes and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. This is a ongoing project, so I welcome your feedback as my team continues our work on uh, increasing democratic governance of AI. So today I'm going to present to you the, uh, the results of the U.S. Public Assembly on high-risk AI, the first nationally uh, National Public Assembly around AI governance in the US. And uh, if you are interested in reading more about the results, we have a very long technical report available on our website at uh, cndp.us slash AI. And this is a joint project with uh, CNDP or the Center for New Democratic Processes, which is an organization uh, that studies deliberative democracy and also facilitates public assemblies and citizen juries. So 
before I get started, I want to give a shout out to the rest of the team. Uh, this was a big team effort with uh, Kyle Abzenko, Sarah Atwood, and Kate Mays. Kyle and Sarah uh, work at the Center for New Democratic Processes, and they were really helpful in getting us set up in terms of the logistics, and they were also wonderful facilitators, uh, and they authored, co-authored the uh, technical report. Meanwhile, Kate and I, we focused on taking the academic uh, research leadership on this project, including coming up with the research questions, designing uh, key parts of the assembly. And so I couldn't have done this without uh, the excellent team. And I think Kate is also in the audience. Uh, before I dive into our project, I'd like to thank our funders. And we're also uh, trying to be very transparent uh, in this space. So as I mentioned previously, we worked with the Center for New Democratic Processes, a nonpartisan nonprofit uh, civic engagement and research organization that has a lot of experience running these types of public assemblies. Uh, and it's a partnership with uh, my employer, uh, the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. And our funding uh, came through uh, philanthropic organizations, including uh, Schmidt Futures, where I'm currently an AI 2050 Early Career Fellow uh, that is funding uh, a major component of this project. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund uh, is funding our outreach efforts, uh, our efforts to publicly share uh, the findings of this project. And finally, the surveys that we have conducted was funded uh, through the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, or CIFAR. In terms of the parameters of this public assembly, we have sort of three strong emphasis. First of all, it is a nonpartisan process where we uh, you know, did not affiliate with any particular party. Our participants uh, came from various aspects of the political spectrum. Second of all, um, this was an independent and deliberative process. So by independent, uh, we maintained our integrity as a partnership between academics and a civil society group. So this was not done through any tech companies and Deliberative uh, might be sort of in the name of the, uh, the public assembly where the participants really learned a lot from the expert witnesses who gave them information and they were able to deliberate amongst themselves when, uh, when they're thinking about what policy recommendations to make. And then finally, we emphasize the social technical context of risks when it comes to AI. So it wasn't just purely sort of focused on the technical or the computer science aspects of harms from AI, but we really brought in expert witnesses who uh, come from the social sciences who are able to explain how um, existing problems within our social and political structures leads to harms from AI, and then the outputs from the AI systems can then feed back into uh, harms to individuals and communities. So we being uh, trained in the social sciences really took a social technical approach to risk. So the charge of the public assembly uh, based on what we had uh, deliberated for amongst each other as, uh, as the project leads was first of all to identify what are the levels of risks associated with uh, AI systems? Many of you perhaps have heard of other risk frameworks from NIST to the EU AI Act. And so we decided to uh, certainly teach our participants about those existing risk frameworks, but also we wanted to hear what they think is an appropriate risk framework, especially given that generative AI systems that have come online or have become more popular in the past year can pose a, a 
can be both high risk and low risk given their uh, their being more general purpose. So that was something that we wanted to investigate. Beyond thinking about the risk framework, we were also interested in accountability and responsibility. So if AI harms were to occur, who should be held accountable? Is it the developers? Is it the users? Um, and, and so we're moving beyond just thinking about a risk framework. And then finally, we wanted to think about harms and not only risks. So when a harm happens, uh, who is accountable? And, and in terms of uh, the severity of harms, how do uh, the general public think about the severity? Before diving into the results, I want to share with you a brief uh, summary of our research methodology. So in terms of the methodology, we began with a 3,000 national uh, recruitment survey to reach out to a wide swath of the U.S. adult population. And so we conducted the survey through a survey firm, Verisight, um, and the survey asked volunteers to participate in the assembly. Uh, we also use the survey as a opportunity to ask the public about their attitudes uh, towards AI, their knowledge about AI. And uh, nearly 2,100 respondents opted in to join the applicant pool. We were very happy that so many people decided to volunteer. Um, and of all of these volunteers, we had to narrow it down to uh, 40 participants because uh, this is a very deliberative process. It would be hard for you know more than 2,000 people to deliberate uh, um, via video conferencing. So what we did was uh, we uh, used a sortition algorithm so that we had a stratified sample of 40 participants where we wanted to balance between equal probability of selection, but also making sure that the 40 participants are representative of the demographic characteristics of the US adult population. So to give you a sense of what that means, I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, sorry, this text is kind of small. Um, To give you a sense of what this means, uh, we wanted to balance between considerations like where did people live? Did they live in an urban area or did they live in a rural area? We wanted to have a balance of that, as well as geographic regions. Um, we couldn't do it by state, but we try to do it by census regions. And we were able to cover uh, participants from 21 different states. We also wanted to, uh, have representativeness in terms of age group, gender, level of education, employment, uh, their political affiliation, their race and ethnicity, and as well as their level of technical knowledge about AI. We didn't just want to select people who are super knowledgeable about AI. We also wanted people who, you know, they said they didn't have much knowledge about AI. And what was really uh, exciting for the, the research team, when we first met with these 40 participants was just to, uh, it's kind of incredible to see this wide range, uh, diverse group of people come together on Zoom to participate. We had uh, college students, we had folks who are retired, we have uh, people who are working full time. We also have uh, folks who were unemployed. Uh, we had people who, uh, have a technical background, but we also have people who said, you know, I don't know much about AI, but this seems really interesting. And I want to uh, give a, you know, give my say in terms of how AI is governed. Um, I also like to emphasize that we did compensate the participants. They were paid uh, $30 per hour to participate through the process. And the process took uh, two weeks. So it was 40 hours in total. In terms of 
the assembly itself, what we first did was we had a, we put together an oversight panel to make sure that uh, the assembly really met our goals of being nonpartisan, being independent, uh, that the expert witnesses who presented to the participants weren't uh, swaying them one way or the other, they, that the material they presented was clear, accurate, uh, and really fulfilled sort of the requirements for educating the participants. So we uh, got together and uh, and asked these folks to be on our oversight panel. And as you can see, they represent both academics, civil society groups, and we also had industry representation, although not from any particular tech company. I mentioned uh, quite a lot about these uh, expert witnesses. So one part of the assembly that was really important was to educate the participants, many of whom don't have a technical background, uh, most of them don't have a technical background about how AI systems work. And so we, uh, kindly asked eight expert witnesses to make uh, PowerPoint presentations that are able to educate the participants. And the participants after the presentations were able to then ask questions of the expert witnesses, clarifying questions or questions that um, took what was in the slides and uh, uh, they wanted to have a more in-depth understanding. And the first set of presentations were introduction to how AI systems work, um, how they're built using data. Um, we had a whole unit about uh, how data is collected and then oftentimes moved around, either bought or sold or somehow transferred uh, so that computer scientists are able to use it to build AI systems. And also we had a presentation on current existing ethical and regulatory frameworks around AI governance, including um, a description of how the EU AI Act uh, at the time, how that was uh, proposed and uh, eventually uh, adopted. But we didn't want to sway the participants in terms of saying, you know, this is the model to adopt in the U.S., but we did want to give them an understanding that it's not, uh, while there isn't currently uh, federal level regulation, there's possibility of regulation outside the U.S., in addition to these high level presentations, we also had presentations that focused on four specific domains uh, of AI systems. And we chose these because we thought there were very tangible uh, data objects that the participants generate or that, that they have interacted with. So uh, the first one focused on browser and search history, uh, how that is used to then feed content back to participants in terms of uh, sort of uh, algorithmic display of contents on social media, but also uh, now uh, search engines are moving towards using generative AI to give information back to uh, those who put in a prompt. Health records was another uh, major domain that the participants talked about. It, was actually the um, domain that participants felt the most personal uh, sort of affinity to in that they have interacted with doctors and they have seen their, uh, you know, my chart. We also uh, had presentations on uh, the image of a face. So we weren't just talking about facial recognition systems uh, in, in terms of that domain. Certainly that's part of it, but also now that uh, generative AI can be used to uh, generate images based on uh, someone's photo, that gets the participants thinking, oh, it's not just a facial recognition system, but the image of my face could be used in other ways, perhaps ways that are that they don't consent to. 
And then finally, we had a unit on administrative records, uh, such as, say, tax records or uh, someone's criminal history and how that can be used to make predictions about them, uh, not just by uh, governmental agencies, but by banks uh, and other private actors. So these are the expert witnesses that uh, presentations that the respondents, uh, the participants listened to. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over the four domains. Uh, some of this is repeated. Um, what? So after listening to the presentations by the expert witnesses, um, there is a deliberative process that the participants uh, discussed. So they identified potential benefits, not just harms, from these applications. And then they also indicated the level of risk, low, medium, or high, uh, and also unacceptable when it comes to narrow uses of, uh, say, using your browser or history uh, data to create an AI system. Um, for instance, if based on what they post on Facebook or Instagram, what the algorithm does in terms of uh, the ranking of the content that they see. Um, so they're asked to identify the level of risk, not only for the, these narrow um, purpose AI, but for more general purpose AI. Um, and then also thinking about future or secondary uses of this data within AI systems. Likewise, we did that for health records, Uh, image of a face. Likewise, um, I had mentioned uh, earlier that we focused on not just facial recognition systems, but how uh, generative AI can use people's photos to uh, generate images or even videos in the future. Administrative records. So for each of these four domains, uh, there was a deliberation, and then finally a voting where that was done through a survey where uh, after discussing these questions, the each individual participant uh, voted on the level risk when it comes to, say, general purpose AI within this domain versus narrow purpose AI within this domain or future um, or secondary uses. I wanna, um, so all the results are found in that report. Um, in the interest of time, I thought I might wanna show some other results, but in terms of general trends when it comes to these deliberations and voting, um, response and respondents were able to recognize that uh, narrow purpose AI comes with risks, but they indicate that general purpose AI has higher levels of risk. Um, and they were able to articulate that with general purpose AI, these risks are maybe not necessarily, uh, that researchers might have not possibly identified all of these risks. There are things that might not be anticipated uh, and so there is a sort of inherent risk when the AI systems are so general that the developers might not have anticipated all of these risks. And in terms of moving beyond the risk framework and thinking about accountability, uh, respondents were asked which parties or actors in the AI life cycle should be held accountable when an individual or group is harmed or an incorrect decision is made by AI system. Um, as you can see here, uh, respondents across the board in, in these four domains, they think that the, um, the developers should be held accountable um, as well as uh, the deployers. Uh, so if you can think about uh, a business buying a piece of software from a developer and then deploying it should be held more accountable than say uh, the consumers or the users themselves. And then um, beyond thinking about who should be accountable, then there's the, the question of 
who should determine which parties or actors should be held accountable when harm is done. Uh, you can think of it as, you know, who should be regulating um, the, the, uh, to prevent harms or to readdress harms from AI systems. And overwhelmingly, the participants think that the government or regulatory bodies should do it. Um, and if the current political, uh, current existing governmental agencies, if they can't do it, they think that a new agency or department should be created to, um, to be able to regulate AI systems. Finally, I want to share the results regarding how um, severe participants think that uh, harms from AI systems are. And what's really interesting here is that, yes, it is true that people think AI systems, when they make an incorrect or erroneous decision about a person's, uh, about a person that has a adverse material impact. That is a very severe harm, uh, as you can see here. Um, but what's interesting is they also think if the AI makes a decision that violates a person's civil or human rights, uh, that is as severe of a harm. And even when the AI system is technically correct in making that prediction, they still think that is a very severe harm. And then finally, uh, in terms of determining harms, there is um, sort of a parallel conversation that the participants were having in terms of not thinking only about harms from AI systems, but the uh, questions about data privacy and consent where, um, where an AI system appropriates an individual's data without their consent, that is also viewed as quite harmful or if uh, the AI system appropriates an individual's likeness, for instance, the sound of their voice or their face without their consent, that is also seen as quite severe in terms of harm. So I'm going to stop here uh, in the interest of time and give you a chance to ask questions. I've already seen some uh, questions maybe in the chat. I'm happy to uh, hear your feedback. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, actually, we don't have any questions. This is a first for us. I encourage you to put your questions because we really want to hear from you in the Q&A and I will read them out loud. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat either. So again, please don't be shy. We'll keep you anonymous. It's not a big deal. But this is very important work and we want to hear from you. So while people are putting their questions, hopefully, in the q and um, I'll ask one. Please continue to do so. We do have one, so I'll, um, I'll get to that shortly. Um, I'm going to be a mean bitch and just ask you, Bao Bao, how can you generalize about public opinion based on a small sample of 40 that is representative, but you know, you did this via Zoom. So it is sort of a a biased environment, if you will, or it's it's just it's hard to really replicate that to know that this is so what what do you say to that? That's a very good question. Um I think I like to say that we understand that this is one methodology to gauge public's attitudes, um, other components of our work, as I mentioned earlier, focus on um, public opinion surveys where we're able to get data from a much larger um, group of people, like 3,000 <laughs> American adults instead of just these 40 people. But there are some trade-offs that we see in terms of uh, doing a public opinion survey where you only have 15 minutes with the with each respondent and they might not be paying attention. And also it's very hard to educate them uh, in a 15 minute survey. Whereas uh, at the end of the 40 hours the of the public assembly, the participants said, wow, I learned a lot. And universally uh, when we did a follow-up survey uh, at the end of the, uh, the assembly, 
the participants, uh, almost all of them said, yes, I have uh, substantial knowledge of AI that I'm able to explain it to my friends and family. So that is a big trade-off. Um, and in terms of the public assembly, whether it works on Zoom or not, I think it really comes down to um, having expert facilitation. The team I worked with was really good about doing this on Zoom. Um, we had participants who were also very engaged. We had participants at the end um, when we were saying goodbye to each other who were sharing, you know, very emotional thank yous. We had some folks who cried. It was, uh, it was. I, I felt like the participants were, um, nearly all of them were deeply engaged. Um, and that was a trade-off that we thought about um, doing it in person would, uh, it's obviously a better experience, but we were also thinking about accessibility. Uh, it's much harder for participants to all travel to a central location. There's also the cost issue. And so this was a compromise we made. And I think it was um, the right one. And uh, as I mentioned previously, this was the first national public assembly of this kind done in the US. We uh, went into this project you know, this is a pilot in many ways, trying to figure out whether it's doable to bring uh, people from such a politically polarized uh, country together. And also, uh, would people be able to learn enough of the technical details to be able to deliberate? And I think this has shown that with enough prep work and getting the good facilitators and expert witnesses together with engaged participants, we're able to do this work. Right. One thing but we need to stress is you paid the participants. Does that bias the results? Who knows? OK, we have some great questions. Um, the first question asks if you uh, discussed groups that are subject to systemic discrimination, such as monitored and criminalized groups. Yes, that was something that was repeatedly emphasized by the um, expert witnesses. So several of them have said that, especially in the discussion around uh, administrative records, also facial recognition systems, and uh, how AI is used in uh, healthcare. What was really interesting um, with these expert witnesses, what they emphasize is that how data is collected um, and the biases and discriminatory practices that our society, you know, pre-existing to the creation of these AI systems really impact how these AI systems are developed. And then after hearing that, some of the participants who are uh, who have faced discrimination themselves are then able to sort of reflect on this knowledge and then connect it to uh, the deliberation about AI systems. Thank you for that answer and thank you for that question. Okay, what sort of challenges, I'm skipping a question because one of them, I just need the person to clarify this question. Um, uh, so what is the most challenging part of putting this forum together? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there were a few logistical challenges that we faced. One is trying to recruit actually the expert witnesses. Um, I think in the US, because this is relatively new, uh, we had reached out to experts in the field, but they weren't quite sure, you know, how um, they're used to talking to uh, maybe a more technical audience, people within their own academic disciplines. So some of them said, you know, I, I'm not sure I can do this with uh, a general public, but we were able to luckily find people who are really good at public communication to agree to do this. Um, the other challenging aspect of putting this forum together was um, recruiting the participants. While we had a lot of folks who said, um, yes, I'm happy to volunteer, but when you actually reach out to them, 
Uh, I think there's sort of this distrust if you make a phone call and say, hey, we're willing to pay you money to participate in this you know, civic activity. Some of them were like, ah, oh, I'm not sure. Like, is this a scam? Um, but luckily we were able to, you know, we had some, we had backup um, participants selected so that we were able to get, reach the number that we um, got, that we had planned, but it took a lot of effort. And thank you uh, to Sarah Atwood, who really did a good job recruiting the participants. Thank you for your answer. Um, I'm not sure this is a relevant question for you, but let's ask it. Maybe you can provide some insights. What is the role for consumer-based watchdogs for AI? Yeah, so I think um, one of the sort of reflecting on what the participants said, um, there was, uh, so there was discussions uh, amongst the participants that we need something similar to say an FDA uh, for AI. Um, among the participants, there were some who said, you know, there should be a governmental agency more such uh, similar to the FDA. Uh, but some said, you know, it could also be maybe something like consumer reports where it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan group, but it's not governmental, it's not a governmental agency. And so the, the participants um, saw sort of the need for both or the, yeah, that was a, yeah, they saw it like a possibility for both to exist. Okay. Um, here's some really wonderful questions about this. So basically, what's what's next for you, given the difficulties with educating the survey respondents? What are some ways to educate the larger public on AI uses and harms before they become widespread? Yeah, I think that is a very good question. Um, what was interesting in talking with the respondents before they went through this process um, was that there were a lot of maybe misunderstandings or um, a lot of the pre-existing notions that participants had about risks from AI, uh, they had it from, you know, Hollywood movies. So a lot of them talked about, oh, is it like going to be like the Terminator or is it going to be, I don't know, like the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movie where there was a rogue AI that was trying to take over the world. Um, and, and so the a lot of the popular understanding comes from pop media rather than say uh, mm -hmm. the news sources. And also some news sources are quite sensational. So I think it's important to address these uh, gaps in understanding. Um, what we're hoping to do is to make some of the uh, resources that were shown to the public, uh, publicly available. Um, I think, in terms of uh, my own work as an educator, uh, certainly teaching students, whether that's you know K through 12 or college students about the uses and harms of AI is kind of critical. Um, it, it, in a formal educational uh, setting, it's much easier to do that. But I also think, um, journalists and um, other you know, content creators on social media, they also have a role to play. And uh, right now, I think the sort of the expert, uh, there hasn't been fully this expert consensus around harms from AI systems that, um, that all the experts agree on, but at least there could be maybe a network of experts who are able to put out some guidelines on how to educate the public, because I, I think a lot of them are sort of focused on debating each other rather than um, educating the public at large. Okay, um, that is a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, and then um, another follow-up question on the study is, were there any questions that didn't make the final survey that you would ask in the future? Yeah, um, so this project is, as I mentioned, uh, sort of an initial 
step towards um, other projects I'm hoping to do in the future. In a way, it is sort of a feasibility study. Are we able to logistically put together a public assembly? Uh, are we able to educate the participants so that they are able to make policy recommendations? Um, I think in the future, I'm more interested in uh, more fine-grained uh, policy debates that I don't have an answer to. For instance, um, should open source AI systems uh, be somehow restricted? Are, are they truly dangerous? Um, that is something that the computer science community is currently debating. We have lots of folks who say, you know, open source is great. It prevents monopolies. It, pre uh, it democratizes the use of AI. But then there's concerns that bad actors might misuse it. So that's just one example of, of a more fine-grained uh, policy debate that we could apply this methodology to. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's such a good point. The other points about it, though, is like, so supposedly yesterday, I think I sent you this, Bao Bao, that um, the Allen Institute came out with a fully open source, the first fully open source data set, model weights, et cetera. And now peeking inside the hood, apparently it is it is more than any other one, but it's not fully transparent regarding the different data sets. So, you know, this meaning of what is open and what is closed is, is a toughie. Um, we have a really excellent question here. I'm gonna try to make sure I communicate it because I see uh, the author of this question wrote it again. She's basically trying to say, could we use AI, which includes a lot of personal and public data, um, to systemically analyze outputs by AI to measure public opinion? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, there certainly have been experiments in terms of um, say using large language models to create uh, essentially synthetic people um, to and, and have them interact in a virtual environment. Um, and these uh, agents were able to negotiate and communicate or even form alliances. What worries me a bit about how um, sort of the limitations of generative AI in that context is in terms of the training data, you can imagine certain groups generate a lot more content on the internet than that could be fed into these AI systems and other groups. Um, and we know that men and younger people participate a lot more in online conversations. Uh, so for the groups where there is a lot of online uh, content being generated by those groups, it's going to give you a much better representation of their views and their attitudes. Uh, for our purpose, you know, we wanted a deliberation that was representative of the U.S. population. And just like speaking with the participants, yes, they're, you know, all online, but some of them are not very uh engaged in terms of posting online, you know, they're more sort of passive viewers. And as you can imagine, a generative AI tool um, that is not going to be very representative of their views because they're just not represented in the training data. Um, and one concern that I have um, in terms of how generative AI is going to affect uh, works of survey researchers or those who are uh, interested in uh, studying attitudes of the public is that these generative AI tools can be used to take online surveys now. So you might have bots that are um, used to generate survey responses so that someone can get paid, whoever's deploying the bots, and then you're not getting actual humans to take these surveys. And uh, I think that would be really bad for say, understanding not just political attitudes, but say consumer sentiments, um, 
or a variety of other social science measurements that rely on surveys. Thank you so much. Here is a flabbergasting, excellent question. Um, I'm just going to reframe it, but you know, you did a study trying to make AI democratic and participatory, but how can unilateral regulations, decisions by countries with geopolitical heft be classified as democratic and participatory for the global public? Um, given that also that data sets are not really representative of the global public. Yeah. Do you have I any comments? Sure. Um, so I do want to say that we had limited the scope of the study to focus on U.S. politics. Uh, so we're we're not advocating for, say, like international regulation of AI, although certainly uh, when people talk about the Brussels effects, there's also the D.C. effect. So what the U.S. government does impact other parts of the world. Um, there are some folks who want to do uh, a public assembly on the global level, but that could be uh, challenging given that you need to have local context um, and you know which countries would you select to be a part of this. Um, and I certainly recognize the limitations of this approach. Um, I just, I think my team wants to get it right in the US before we, take a, a more global approach. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for that question. Um, it's something we all should be thinking about because you know many developing countries will be importers of AI services and yet over time they'll provide more and more of the data. Um, okay. Um, someone asks, what's the end goal of the study? Is it about gauging public opinion or educating the public? Yeah, so the goal of this project, it is a demonstration of feasibility that we can have meaningful public engagement that involves educating the public. I, I think if you are to just ask, give people a survey um, on a topic where they're not very familiar with, um, sometimes the responses might not make sense sense they might i mean it i i don't want to say it doesn't represent people's preferences but uh people might feel confused and they just you know in a lot of these online surveys uh people want to give a response so that they can collect their uh payment for completing the survey and then you know is it good data that you're getting right um in terms of beyond sort of an academic exercise, I also want to emphasize that this could be used as a meaningful way to engage the public um, when making decisions. A lot of federal agencies, they have calls for comments on, uh, you know, various policies that they're um, considering. And in terms of how public engagement is done, they will make a call for comments. And the Usually the people who answer the call are those who are very well resourced, who have the technical know-hows uh, in the text of, you know, uh, with NIST and their AI um, risk framework or with their recent call for the um, AI safety consortium. Those who are answering the call for comments are tech companies, uh, well-resourced universities, some civil society groups. But the public is largely left out of those conversations because one, they don't have the technical know-how and two, uh, it, it's very time and labor uh, intensive to actually write up a public comment. So we're thinking about this as a possible way to, for agencies or um, policymakers to have meaningful public engagement and um, while this methodology is not commonly done in the US, uh, other countries have uh, used this process uh, in various uh, other domains. Uh, the one that, uh, that we felt inspired by, uh, that I felt certainly inspired by when I was planning this project was the Canadian government had 
um, funded a series of public assemblies around uh, regulation of social media platforms um, where people made policy recommendations about how to balance between online safety and free expression. So that was a way for the government to do meaningful public engagement. Um, we thought, why not try this in the US? And it seems feasible, even given the highly technical content of the deliberations. Yeah. And uh, for those who don't know, the EU has tried this significantly with virtual worlds. They've held multiple public education, but they also paid. <laughs> so I think they did it with 250 people, but don't quote me on it. Um, okay, well, let's keep these questions coming. Thank you so much for your thoughtful uh, questions. Um, so we have a few more right now. Um, what is the motivation for policymakers and AI experts to take in consideration the assembly results? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think what's important to consider is trust in AI uh, shouldn't just be seen as, oh, we checked a bunch of boxes in terms of uh, trustworthiness metrics. Certainly, we should, you know, try to achieve these metrics. But what um, sort of two fears I have is one, the public just blatantly rejects an AI system that is quite safe. Uh, you might make that argument for self-driving cars. They're, you know, they technically cause less accidents than human drivers, but people ha hold them to a much higher metric than cars driven by humans. And then on the converse side of things, another thing that I'm really concerned about is that in even in our democratic societies, we have AI systems that are not technically trustworthy that are being deployed without any public uh, consent and just imposed on the public and they can't opt out, which really goes against uh, democratic values uh, and yeah, so I think that's why um, certainly my team and many others uh, believe that we should engage the public when uh, developing and deploying AI systems. Thank you so much for that answer and thank you for that question. Um, here's another question. One of the critiques of this type of work is that most of the opinion change that occurs happens because of deliberation within sparked by listening to and asking questions of experts rather than discussing these issues with each other. Did you look at this in any way to see what aspects of the forum were driving changes in opinion over the course of participation? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So we try to balance between uh, giving the participants enough time to talk with the experts, to ask questions after their presentations. Um, and also uh, having enough time to deliberate amongst themselves. Um, one thing that I could, uh, so we didn't take survey measures at every stage of the deliberative process. Uh, we usually do them at, we do them at the end of every day, but not sort of in the middle of right after they um, have listened to the experts. But certainly we can, uh, we asked the participants to take notes amongst uh, individually and amongst their small groups when they're listening to the experts and also when they're deliberating. And certainly we can use more qualitative measures to track if there's changes in people's opinions uh, right after they listened to the experts and did their Q and A with the experts versus after they have deliberated amongst themselves. Um, I do have to say that the, one of the things that came up a lot in deliberations amongst themselves was not so much like questions of technical uh, metrics, but sort of the values that they hold uh, where their communities hold and they're deliberating about, you know, I might value this uh, ethical consideration more than this other ethical consideration. And so I think even if you're not a computer scientist, you can have a debate with others about the values that you hold. 
Thank you very much for that answer and thank you for the question. Um, how are the topics selected and were there any topics under consideration cut from the syllabus? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, so one of the things that we did as a team for several months was trying to come up with a balance between having introducing to the participants a general understanding of AI versus more concrete domains that we um, felt that they could understand and that they it that is tangible to the participants. Um, one of the things that I wish we had spent more time on uh, is uh, as we were developing this project, generative AI became, uh, there was like a big boom with ChatGPT and Dolly and um, Stable Diffusion and all these generative AI models that were coming online. And I wish we had spent more time with those uh, sort of the new things. But at the same time, we recognized that just because uh, we don't want to fall into a fallacy where we just focus on the new things when there are AI systems that are deployed, like, I don't want to say old school, but like facial recognition was a big topic of debate for uh, many years before sort of text to image generators became a, a more salient topic. So we wanted to have a balance between the old, not super old, but more pre-existing systems versus sort of generative AI, which is a talk of the town nowadays. Um, and so trying to balance between the two means that we had to cut down on content for both, but that was a trade-off that we, we made. Thank you. Okay, this might have to be the last question, depending on the answer. Did you do some qualitative evaluation on longer form responses? Yes, that um, so beyond the qualitative, uh, the quantitative assessment of like severity of risk and levels of harm, we also asked respondents to justify their responses. So to add, um, we gave them big text boxes where they can say, you know, I think this because, um, or uh, specific groups that they think is more likely to be harmed. Uh, and you can find a uh, you can find compilations of these responses in our report. Unfortunately, I couldn't share them all on the in the PowerPoint, but they're in the report. And we're going to uh, do more scholarly assessments of those responses uh, in our uh, uh, future academic works based on this project. Thank you so much for all your but, uh, Bob, uh, before you uh, wrap up, okay. did you want to give any final uh, assessment of this? I wanted to give you the opportunity to make final comments. Um, thank you. I just thought I thank the audience for being so engaged and asking lots of excellent questions. Um, my final thought is uh, this has been a really rewarding process. And I'd like to thank my team for doing such an amazing job. And I'm happy to talk with you if you're interested in doing similar projects. Um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, thank you all for being so engaged. Thank you all. We really appreciate your attending. We will have another webinar uh, next month, um, probably on openness and AI, <laughs> speaking of the devil. Um, and uh, we welcome your comments. Thank you to our co-organizers and sponsors. And thank you, Dr. Bao Bao Zhang. You're doing great work. Keep it up, girl. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend, everyone. See you later, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day.